1971. We woke up in a different world, where the Cold War ended along with the Vietnam carnage. All because of the dome. The dome. A territory full of anomalous artifacts, phenomena, and organisms. We still don't know what it is. An alien city? Some kind of a testing ground or storage? Whatever it is, no living thing trapped under the dome can escape it. Yet even this did not stop the research. The major powers created the Cronus Mega Corporation to develop and explore the dome. Its secrets became a lucrative business. The Spire Station was built on top of the dome to export the artifacts and import supplies and personnel. The city of Crystal Sands grew at the foot of the dome, eventually becoming a major transportation hub. All this required thousands of employees, and there was no shortage of candidates. Romantics, pragmatists, and adventurers of all trades swarmed recruiting centers around the globe, seeking jobs at Cronus. You were one of those people. In 1976, your application was approved, and you went under the dome towards the future. Whether a good one or a bad one, only time will tell.
A guy wearing thick spectacles thrusts out a sweaty hand. Monty James, Silverwing. He glances down at your badge. Ah, oh, it's you. I found your file extremely interesting. And your CV, wonderful. I inspiring, really. When I had the opportunity to look over the files of my future colleagues, I couldn't resist. I don't want to sound boastful, but silver level clearance has its advantages. Monty winks. Monty makes a ring with his thumb and forefinger. Uh, you were number 63,784 on the waiting list, but you were lucky enough to get into the dome after only 16 months. Besides that, uh, zero, nada, absolutely nothing. You're a dark horse for both the Foundation and myself. Uh, how exactly did you end up in this wing? Oh, I see. Well, if you ever decide to sew together a Frankenstein's monster from the bodies of dead oranges, <laughs> be sure to let me know. The Silver laughs at his own joke, alone. An uncomfortable silence rises between you, and Monty abruptly changes the subject. He taps the narrow illuminator panel with one finger. Uh, look, there's a storm rising. The lightning is strange. Green. Should lightning be green? Uh, this is my first sandstorm. The orange is dressed in a new jumpsuit. The shiny badge on his chest reads, Quentin Bisley, laborer. He's side-eyeing the screen skeptically. Despite his tired, grim expression, his gaze is open and friendly. However, the general impression is unmistakable. There's something frightening about Bisley. The orange's face stretches into a broad smile. Bearing his dentures to the world. Like everyone, duh. In a black car, under guard. There's other guys, too. The ones who go through the front door. He nods at the black-winged woman beside him. Her nose wrinkles in displeasure, but she says nothing. Quentin raises his hands to examine the devices. They call them humane handcuffs. How about that? Truth is, there ain't nothing humane about them. They zap you real hard the moment you get your hands on a gun. But they sure look nice. Bisley lowers his hands again and smirks. A tall woman is watching an ad playing on the monitor, arms crossed. The polished to a shine badge on her black overalls reads, Elsa Olofsson, Security Service. She glances at you and offers her hand in a business-like manner. Greetings. Please take all necessary precautions. By that I mean, don't turn your back on him. Elsa nods at the orange. I just follow orders. Even if his crime was embezzlement, I have to keep him cuffed. Those are the rules. Olison shrugs in a sharp, mechanical way, as if racking the slide of an assault rifle. Our friends from the administration didn't deign to inform me about this man's record. Could be I'm escorting a serial killer. It's corporate policy, you know. She gives the Silver a vengeful look. A man with a mustache and a blue jumpsuit is standing at the window, studying the construction site below through the occasional break in the clouds. His badge reads Igor Patan, planner. The blue taps on the glass with one finger and gestures you to come and take a look. Seems like he doesn't speak English. The thin, pale young woman is sitting at the window, leaning against the illuminator. The glass is slightly fogged with her breath. She turns to you. Her shiny badge reads, Tomoko Kimura, physiologist. We've crossed the border. No way back now. Even traveling by the funicular wasn't so... thrilling. The white, 
press his small hands to her blushing cheeks. You were thinking, why have no children been born under the dome? I've got a working hypothesis, but I'm not ready to share it yet. She says softly, as if answering a question you didn't ask. Kimura peers through the glass in the direction you indicate. Oh, that's the aircraft that crashed into the dome during the first expedition. I believe that's a wing fragment, and there's some white canvas. What do you think that is? Maybe a parachute? The white shakes her head, bewildered. I just can't believe it. It's all true. We're on our way to meet the future. Kimura shoots you a surprised look. You're familiar with the details of the briefing, right? To put it simply, the dome is a selectively permeable environment. The white draws an invisible hemisphere in the air. Inorganic objects may exit the dome without difficulty, but any living creature dies if transported back to the outside world. That's why we're all stuck here for an indefinite period of time. Kimura listens without interrupting, as if considering your every word. It's quite possible. I would like to set up an experiment to test this in practice. She cuts off, abruptly. You exchange glances with the rapidly blushing Kimura. Not in that sense. I mean, yes, in that sense, but it is science, you know? It's quite serious. She purses her lips shyly. This experiment requires at least one man. Kimura blushes even more. I mean, Odrat, you've got it all wrong. I meant to say that one of the participants in the experiment should be a man, and the other should be a woman, which should be obvious. Krona's Foundation presents gleaming, futuristic, state-of-the-art cities straight from the pages of science fiction. Well-paid, safe employment, career advancement opportunities, and a world-class social safety net. Noble and intellectually stimulating work in state-of-the-art laboratories. We're thrilled to welcome you to the Dome. Please hold on to the handrail and prepare for landing. Krona's Foundation presents gleaming, futuristic, state-of-the-art cities. Stopping by the door's porthole, you watch as the ground slowly approaches. It looks brown-black through the tinted glass and smoky blue at the horizon. It almost seems like the clouds are pulling apart there. You scan the desert for any sign of the anomalies you've heard so much about. A flat dark form hangs in the air above the horizon. It vaguely resembles a mushroom cloud, but with a much denser structure. In the distance, you can also see a strange, apparently man-made wall rising from the sand. All the radio ads and TV shows were telling the truth. This place really was made for those who place their trust in science. Just as you're about to move away from the window, you notice a whirlwind beginning to form above the ochre plain. The gathering storm drifts unhurriedly above the desert, a crown of green lightning flashing at its core. Clearly no ordinary weather phenomenon. It must be one of those anomalies. You freeze by the window, unable to avert your gaze. The outlines of the landing site, blurred by clouds of dust, appear behind the greenish glass of the porthole. The capsule shudders as the braking devices engage.
Come here. Come on now, or you'll miss everything. A cheerful man in a white lab coat grabs you by the sleeve. A badge reading Ludovico Nuzzi, scientific analyst, export department, dangles loosely on his clean uniform, which still smells pungently of washing pot. Look over there! He points upward with a sharp, wide gesture and hands you his field binoculars. You raise the binoculars to your eyes. Under fourfold magnification, the whirling cloud above the rust-colored plains looks even stranger. Its core glows with flickering green light and flashes rhythmically, and that rhythm seems to form a complicated pattern. Nazi bends close to your ear. Fascinating. Do you want me to bring some filters? If we intercept the red and blue spectrums, we'll see something amazing. It's like a signal, some kind of message. I don't know. Ludovico laughs unnervingly and snatches the binoculars from your hands. With the binoculars raised to his eyes, he minutely adjusts the focus. It's a massive whirlwind north of Concord, and not merely some desert sandstorm. That's an anomaly. I hope it lasts long enough for me to make a proper observation. The scientist looks blankly at you, then down at his lab coat. Ah, this? This? He lets out a blaring laugh. Ludovico points at the building behind him. I work in Concord Station, categorizing relics. My job is to classify them by rarity. Then the blues package them, silvers issue the documentation, and oranges move them to the cargo capsule. Just like the one you arrived in. Nazi points upward. Then the capsule takes the relics way up there, all the way to the spire, then to crystal sands by the funicular. They get auctioned off and turned into money. It's not like I endorse this, but we all like ourselves a good paycheck, right? He offers you his binoculars once again. Do you want to have a look at the spire? It's amazing. But then, you can look at the spire anytime. Now that sandstorm, that's what's truly amazing. Nazi looks from you to the capsule and to the landing terminal entrance. He flings his arms up. Oh, Miss Scusi! Excuse me, I'm so sorry. You'd better get going or you'll be late for check-in. Your colleagues are already inside. And the storm is growing stronger. Yeah, the storm is growing stronger. The white mutters in fascination, eyes glued to his binoculars, which is fixed on the spinning whirl of clouds.
I'm listening. Bye bye. So where were we? I hope to see you again soon. Hello. Come back again.
Attention, please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. Hello, come up to the desk. Your please. selectron has you. not been properly authorized. Please visit the reception desk to register. A tall receptionist watches you from behind his desk with a bored, haughty look. He waves impatiently at you to approach. The employee glances at you indifferently. His upper lip is ever so slightly curled in contempt. All new employees must register first thing. Uh, come up to the desk, please. The nameplate on the desk tells you you're talking with Dean Rayhet, administrator. The administrator slaps himself on the forehead. Ah, I almost forgot the regulation pre-registration greeting. Just a second. Ray Hutt produces a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder from beneath the desk, rewinds the tape to the beginning, and presses play. The speakers explode with a harsh, crackling sound, over which the tick-tick of a metronome slowly grows louder. Solemn music begins to play and the administrator's face takes on a serious expression. Dear employee, on behalf of the Cronus Foundation, I, Administrator Dean Rayhat, welcome you to your new life under the dome. The administrator clears his throat and continues. By joining our company, you choose the path of science and progress. You are among mankind's best. And we ask that you live up to this. Dean squints down at the monitor. Deserve this title. Do your job honestly. Obey the law. Respect your colleagues and... The music fades and the administrator finishes his speech. And together we will build the best possible future for all mankind. Dean puts the tape recorder away. Now that we're done with the official greeting, I'll register you and upgrade your Selectron. Okay? Dean's hands hover over the keyboard. He gives you a nod. You squeeze into the narrow window, lean over the reception desk, and key your data into the database. After entering Proceed, you return to your seat. Dean mutters discontentedly to himself as he moves back to his terminal. Rayhet scans the computer screen. So your position in the waiting list was 63,784. You've been assigned to Magellan Station. A special bus will bring you there after a series of briefings. Please pass me your Selectron so I can update the firmware. Dean snaps the docking port of your pass to a recess in the casing of his computer. The administrator returns your Selectron. Cronus was founded as a society of scientists and military professionals. White Wingers have special privileges at most of the original locations built in 71 and 72. And there are still purely white zones in Magellan too. Limited access laboratories, operating rooms, the morgue, warehouses, some parts of the reactor. I think you'll like it. Dean continues. All new employees have a short list of tasks to perform on arrival. Do you want to hear all the details, or just the short version? Rayhet nods and points at the ceiling. First, you need a set of combat gear. Talk to Sidney Maynard. He'll give you everything. Dean extends his second finger. Second, weapons. Ms. Margarita Takachenko is the clerk at the armory. After she dispenses your firearm, you'll need to head to the training zone for a brief weapons handling exam. The administrator straightens his third finger. According to the latest regulations, Remember, all employees must attend a briefing on Psy abilities. Apply to instructor Andre Mihat. Dean extends his fourth finger and looks at you meaningfully. Did I tell you about the combat and tactical training? The fourth step is to visit instructor Winston Botherby. And finally, science is the overarching purpose behind everything we do here. Go to Professor Van Alden to learn how to study relics, avoid anomalies, and catalog scientific knowledge. 
This training is mandatory for all wings, not just white. Dean finishes. Dean catches himself. Oh, and when you're done with your trainings, proceed to the waiting room. From there, you'll travel to Magellan by bus. The administrator looks up at you again. That is all. He reaches for the tape recorder, but thinks better of it. Protocol calls for a little welcoming preamble, but dash it all, that's nonsense. Welcome to Concord Station. As he's about to turn away, Dean suddenly remembers something. Oh yes, I sent your mail to your Kairos. Check your new messages. Well, that's all, I think. Kronos Corporation reminds you, please use a public terminal to access your account. Thank you. Kronos Corporation reminds you, please use a public terminal to access your account. Thank you. Oh. It was nice chatting. Dean gives you a short nod as you approach.
do you want? Attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. Hope to see you again soon. Behind the storage counter, you see a small, neat guy. His gingery hair shines with something like brilliantine. His badge says, Sidney Maynard, storekeeper. Oh, what a lovely angel. Came down from the heavens. Good morning, my lady. Is it something urgent? By the way, my name's Sidney. My friends call me Sid, though I prefer a different name. <laughs> Want me to whisper it to you? He smiles languidly, leaning on his elbows against the counter. The effect is more laugh-inducing than playful. Never taking his gaze off you, he reaches under the counter, loses his balance, and clips his chin on the desktop as he falls down. A full minute later, he reappears, grimly rubbing his jaw with a thick logbook. He thumbs through it for a long period, squinting nearsightedly. Eventually, he gives up the struggle and reluctantly puts on his glasses. The silver finally stops and pins down a particular page with his finger. This is your first uniform requisition, right? You can also purchase any equipment you need for the desert directly from me. Maynard smiles at you over his glasses, practically stripping you naked with his gaze. Your voice is enchanting, my lady. I could listen to it forever. But right now, you need to listen to me. I am going to give you some instructions. These are the rules. Sidney fiddles with his hairstyle. So, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Life under the dome can be dangerous. You may get shot, spill acid on yourself, get electrocuted, or suffer the effects of a dangerous anomaly. You may also freeze to death or get fried. That's why it's important to wear protective equipment when traveling outdoors. Of course, in hazardous situations, the equipment will get damaged, and the more it's damaged, the more often one has to repair it. The silver steps back from his counter to indicate the repair kit boxes piled in the back of the warehouse. He points back at the shelves behind him. We've got repair kits for this gear. There are blue wing specialists ready to help you at any large base, of course. But they're not always available, so you'd better learn how to use repair kits and workbenches on your own. Attention. It's a useful Attention. skill. Sydney leans on the counter again and throws you a lazy wink. No one would ever say no to a cutie pie like you, though. Those are all the instructions, by the way. Shall we get to the giving part now? The silver disappears into the back for a while and returns with a small package. Unfolding the package, Maynard shows you a brand spanking new uniform. Sidney proudly shakes out a bright white jacket. It more resembles a thick mantle than a lab coat. Look, this is the most advanced clothing under the dome. It protects from acid, aggressive fauna, and radiation. Not very effectively, though. Don't expect miracles. He raises a finger. One more important thing. In accordance with Order 16-225, helmets and gloves are not issued, but they're available for purchase from me. Please bear in mind that a full set includes headgear or a mask, jacket, trousers, gloves, and boots. Sidney hands you the package. Here's your uniform. 
Enjoy. Attention, attention. Sydney waggles his eyebrows. Anything up to a star in the sky, my dear. Here, take a look. Sydney leans on the counter. Honestly, lady, I'd sell you this entire place and give you an incredible discount if I could. But I'm not the one who sets the prices. The silver winks at you. It's quite awkward. I'm happy to chat about something other than work. I hope you don't mind a little conversation. Sidney playfully smooths down his hair and gives you his brightest smile. You're reluctant to leave me, I can tell. And guess what? That suits me just fine. The silver assumes a serious expression. There's nothing I can do about that. It's a result of the recent cost optimization order. Luckily, you can purchase these items from me. At market price, but yeah. Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. Anything urgent, Mr. Krachkov? Katarzyna, did you mark it as class one again, instead of two? Look, here's the scanner data. It says the relic is a scientific device. Wait, but it's still class one. I'm not going to violate protocol. Katarzyna, my dear, you may violate protocol as long as it benefits the company. Take your lead from your colleagues. Correct your report if you have to, and don't act so innocent. Vladimir, I'm done. How do we mark it? Class two fragile. Tell Noyan the relic should go out with today's flight. Think about it. A class two relic will mean a bigger payoff for the company, and that means a bonus in your wages. Categorizing it as class two means access to state sealed bids. I bet the Brits will buy it. They're always trying to one up us. All right, Mr. Krashkov. I'll correct my report. Carl, add sealed bids to the market. Attention, attention, please handle relics carefully. Damage, your life will be forfeit.
complain to the Silvers about it. An engineer in a bright blue jacket is tinkering with the door lock, cursing under his breath nonstop. Blowing a curly strand of hair off his forehead, he turns to you. You're a newcomer, right? It's a straight up open house here today. He offers you his hand. According to his badge, this is Maxim Penkovsky, technician. The technician slaps the door with one hand. You have to wait until I'm done. Some orange jammed up the lock with chewing gum just for a laugh. They're like animals, those oranges, marking their territory. If you ask me, they're too gracious about those bastards in Crystal Sands. Penkovsky grunts angrily. <laughs> I wish I could. I'm gonna have to disassemble, clean, and reassemble it to get it working. It's work I don't need, and all thanks to some idiot. Maxime extracts a thin, sharp, precision probe from behind his ear and dangles it in front of you. Well, there's another way. You want to learn something about picking locks? It's a useful skill in all sorts of situations. He looks at you expectantly. The blues getting excited. All right, looky here. Penkovsky presses his pick lock and an odd device resembling a hybrid of a screwdriver and a can opener into your hand. Using a mechanical pick lock is easy peasy. No special skill required. Remember, they wear out after a few locks. The while the old place. fashioned kind is another True. thing entirely. Cheap, one use. But one has to know how to use it right. That's a tool for a master. Maxime takes out another pick lock and crouches by the door. He gives you a quick lesson on how to pick a lock. By the way, you can carry your tools in your belt. It's much handier to have them right there. Penkovsky shows you his utility belt where he keeps all kinds of tools and gadgets. Actually, finding tools under the dome is no problem at all. There are even devices for hacking terminals and so on. Maxime hoists up his belt. The blue solemnly raises his index finger. And one more thing. Always use brand name stuff if you can. Groovy produces good kits. Modus and Supercolor do too. They've all got fat contracts with Cronus, so they Attention. care about quality. He looks at the door again. Damn these locks. Though I'd rather be doing this than fixing hab pods. Those are a real pain in the ass. Penkovsky gives you a patronizing look. Because they're poorly made, warped from the heat, and the filters aren't worth a damn. The modules were constructed by marketing managers, not engineers. Building a city in the desert was also their idea. This project is all about PR. Cronus wants to show the world how tough they are. I repeat, get a lockpick and attach it to your utility belt. And then, um, apply it to the door. Yes, apply is the proper word. The smell of good tobacco wafts off this tall, portly woman from a meter away. A black lacquered pipe, an open logbook full of signatures, and a metal flip calendar sit on the counter in front of her. A small nameplate reads, Margarita Tukachenko. The woman fixes her coppery hair with one hand and casually lights her pipe. To what do I owe the pleasure? Her voice is deep and gravelly. 
Margarita thumbs back a couple of pages in her logbook. I see. This was your first receipt. She glances at her Kairos, looks at you, snorts, and retreats to the shelves. Tukachenko returns a couple of minutes later, carrying something that looks more like a toy than a weapon. The weapon seems weightless as she spins it around her finger. I ain't telling you shit about this thing, because that's exactly how much I know. Laser, schmazer, cadmium battery, fiberglass body, blah, 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 blah. You probably know more about it than I do. Here. Margarita drags on her pipe and releases a puff of thick yellow smoke. I see you know the rules and won't cause problems. Takachenko bites down on the stem of her pipe. Are you kidding me? I'm a different breed. One that doesn't understand toy guns. What if it turns out to be radioactive? Sorry, but I can't help you out on this one. The Black regards the Andromeda suspiciously. Fuck it. If it breaks, bring it back and I'll trade it in for another one. There was a little cloth in the box it came in for cleaning the lens. That's all I know. The armorer shrugs, puffing indifferently on her pipe. It's the least I could do. We have a requisition list from the Silvers. For free, you receive only rubbish. If you want the real deal, check out the weaponry shop. Or me. Wait a minute. Sign your name here in the meantime. Margarita reaches under her counter and produces a set of ammunition. A new set of ammo is issued for every task, but there's so much bureaucracy you'll go daft. Expenditure report. Form number 16. Disposal form. The silver's running true to form. So if you need more ammo, I recommend you either search or barter for it. Or learn how to craft it on your own. These are useful skills. Trust me. Leaning over the counter, the black points somewhere off to one side. Now it's time for your training. Father B is already waiting for you by the big gate. He's a bit dotty, but a good man nonetheless. But before the training zone, go see that wizard guy with his toothpicks. Be careful around him, though. Don't let him pitch you a line. Psychic my ass. She winces in disgust. Um, apply it to the door.
Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. Sydney playfully smooths down his hair and gives you his brightest smile. Sydney waggles his eyes. Sydney leans on the counter. Honestly, lady, I'd sell you this entire place and give you an incredible discount if I could. But I'm not the one who sets the prices. Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. The silver winks at you. It's quite awkward. I'm happy. to the door. Yes, apply is the proper word. Well, you've got quite an aura. A lean silver with thick black hair and a huge cigar clamped in his teeth is sitting in front of you. As you approach, he flashes a sly grin and slowly raises an outstretched hand above the table. Something really weird happens. 
All the paper clips, pencils, scattered toothpicks, and bits of trash float up from the table and hang in the air. The silver badge reading Andre Mihai, Science Instructor, floats up as well. You thrust your hand forward and your outspread fingers emit barely visible sparks of energy. Pencils, paper clips, toothpicks, and pistachio shells dance chaotically in the air. The silver sticks out his lower lip as if to say, not bad, not bad, and gives you a thumbs up. The objects clatter back onto the table. <laughs> Here for the briefing, huh? Shall we get to it? He takes the cigar out of his mouth and exhales a lush cloud of smoke. The silver props his elbows on the table. Anyway, here's the deal. It's more profitable for people with a high psyche to study psionics. Give me your hand. Not waiting for an answer, he grabs your hand with strong, dark fingers. Andre gropes your hand with an expression of fierce concentration. So, do you practice? Bells, bulbs, brushing mugs off the table, huh? The silver takes a thin glove covered in talc from his desk and passes it to you. Look, a glove, right? But it isn't just a glove. This is an ooh, mama, hold me tight glove. It takes energy from your noggin, your psyche, and pew, concentrates it. He counts off on his fingers. Learn psionics. Put on the glove. Transform energy into the necessary shape. That's the whole briefing. Simple? Simple. Now to your questions, huh? You don't have to ask him twice. Mihai picks up a light bulb from the table, gripping the base in his hand. The filament begins to glow faintly. Soon enough, it comes to full heat and glows bright orange. In a little over a second, the bulb is shining with a steady white light. The silver laughs contentedly. The silver takes a pull at his cigar and releases a self-important puff of smoke. Psionics. It's a gift for all of us. The forefathers took off someplace. Poof. Gone. Only the dome remains. And this... Psionics, huh? He rocks back in his armchair, puffing on his cigar. The toothpicks again slowly rise up from the table. Mihai spreads his dark hands. Toothpicks hover around his head in a kind of halo. Scientists say everyone has an organic skill called psyche. You have it, I have it, everyone has it, uh-huh. Big psyche? You got talents. Small psyche? No talents. You'll need to carry a lighter all your life. Get a lockpick and attach it to your utility belt. And then, um, apply it to the door. Is the proper word. Don't touch my things. Remember, our honest work will make the world a better place. World a better place. Attention, attention. Please handle the leak carefully. Get a lockpick and attach it to the Yes, apply is the proper word. Apply is the proper word. I repeat, get a lockpick and attach it to your utility belt. And then, um, apply it to the door. Yes, 
Apply is the proper word. You're doing great. All right, off you go. I'll keep working on this lock because of that orange. Hey, ho. Welcome under the dome. An amazing excursion to a. Attention. Greetings! Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life is in forfeit. Attention, attention, please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life is in forfeit. See ya.
don't, an amazing excursion to a world of mystery. Salutations. work will make the world a better place. World, a better place. I hope to see you again soon. Hiya.
Welcome under the dome, an amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization. Listen to this information, useful for all wings, and receive a colorful leaflet. A middle-aged black is sitting behind the counter with his hands in his lap. The buttons and zippers on his uniform are polished to a shine, and even his badge, Winston Botherby Instructor, has been buffed so much it hurts to look at it. Botherby frowns as you approach. Your first act is being late for the briefing. Are you going to be late for your funeral as well? Black looks you over. Yes, I see the weapon received check mark. Looks like you are fully prepared to disappoint me. You are prepared, right, employee? Botherby leans over the counter and directs you to the doors. Behind this door is a combat simulation computer. Launch it and begin your course. He raises his index finger. The conditions in the training zone closely simulate those one would experience in the field. Your goal is to avoid getting lost and dying of dehydration. And try to aim the barrel away from yourself when shooting. Pulling a notepad from his pocket, the instructor jots down your name. Your goal is to hit three targets. I'm going to monitor you and advise as necessary. And try not to burst into tears. That's all. Go ahead.
Botherby nods grandly. You made it through training without making a total fool of yourself. Congratulations. I'll send a report up the chain about your completely unanticipated success. You're dismissed, employee. useful for all wings and receive a colorful leaflet welcome under the dome an amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization listen to this information useful for all wings and receive you see a tall scientist in a white lab coat bathed in the dim lamplight he almost appears to be hovering above the laboratory floor the man turns at your footsteps he's holding a paper clipboard and a pencil his shimmering silver badge reads Sebastian Van Ullman. He glances from you to the glittering watch on his wrist. I want us to respect one another's time. Please speak loudly, clearly, and to the point. You must be the newcomer I was told about. Nice to meet you. Finished with his unusual greeting, he offers you his thin hand. The scientist puts the clipboard aside, raises his watch for a closer look, and sets the timer. He shows you his watch dial. According to the rules of this briefing, I have to touch on a large number of topics. Therefore, I will do so very briefly. Do not interrupt me. When I'm finished, I'll answer your questions. Within regulations, of course. Sebastian produces his handheld and clicks some buttons. I checked your scanner. It's working and is connected to the Minerva database. Everything you scan will earn you Kronos or Forefather's knowledge points. The instructor watches you with displeasure. Are you listening? Scan everything that might be of scientific interest. First of all, anomalies. They could be dangerous. Make sure to always have medication with you. He places a canvas pouch in your hand. This pouch is full of bolts. You can temporarily discharge an anomaly by throwing a bolt into it. It's primitive, but reliable. Van Olden pushes a button on his stopwatch. So, my oral briefing fell within the allotted span of time. Any questions you want to ask me? Sebastian snorts skeptically. Oh, great. You're even ignorant of the basics. Minerva is a mainframe located at Magellan Base, where you'll be going soon, by the way. Remember, our honest work will make the world a better place. The Minerva Disk stores the database containing every piece of information about the Dome and the company's employees. It is thanks to this scanning that the database is constantly updated. Are you ready for the second part of the briefing, or do you have any more questions? The instructor looks at his chronometer again. The white scowls in annoyance. Do you know anything at all? What did you come under the Dome for anyway? You get knowledge points for scanning objects. For scanning anomalies and relics, you receive forefather points. Scanning the company's property and employees, living or dead, earns you Kronos knowledge points. He explains with a sagacious expression. You can exchange knowledge points for medication and equipment as part of the volunteer research program. Are you ready for the next part? The clock is ticking. The instructor taps his watch meaningfully. Sebastian pulls a scanner from his pocket. I will demonstrate this only once. To switch on the scanner, press the button on the right side of the manipulator housing. The scanning beam is narrow. It's intended to focus on one object at a time. Van Olden turns on the scanner and continues. My advice is to scan anything that might be of scientific or statistical interest. Relics, forefathers' objects, automatic doors, vehicles, vending machines, deceased employees. He turns the screen so you can see it. The scanner automatically transmits data to the Minerva system, and you receive knowledge points. Do you have any questions, or can we proceed to the practical part of our briefing? You'll need some one-use stimulator injectors, bandages to stop bleeding, and anti-radiation agents and radio protectors, including ARAD-3. The white ticks these off on his fingers. He produces a black-capped, transparent plastic jar out of his pocket. According to protocol, you should have this medicine. I'll give it to you as soon as we proceed to the practical part of the briefing. Are you ready, by the way, or do you have any questions? The researcher winces. Why do I have to spell out every single thing for you? 
take a bolt, throw it at the anomaly, and it goes off. Any more questions? The scientist glances at his watch again. You're within the time limit for questions. The next step is training in the artificial eco-zone. He rests one finger on the button in preparation to start the timer. You're going to go downstairs and scan relics. I will be monitoring your progress. Please note there are several radioactive anomalies in the eco-zone. These are the same conditions you'll be working in in the field. Radioactive zones and relics are quite common under the dome. He smoothly extracts a jar of yellow pills from his pocket. Here's your air at three. And one more thing. Just a moment. Welcome under the dome. An amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization. Listen to this. Decontamination to end. Van Oldham gestures back at the eco zone. You haven't completed scanning everything yet. Finish the task first. Journal entry, a successful scanning attempt. You're doing all right so far. Go ahead. Keep an eye on you and make sure you don't screw it Sebastian meets you on the platform. Your finishing time is within the acceptable range. He clicks the stopwatch button, fixing the result time. The scientist turns back to his notes. Not bad. One question. You observed several anomalies while scanning. Why do you think they appeared? I'd like to hear your opinion. The scientist assumes a superior expression. I knew you'd come up with something like that. I see you understand nothing about the nature of anomalies. So let me add a couple of points. He glances at the shimmering blue light in the eco zone. The truth is, we don't know the precise reason for these phenomenon either. We actually know nothing, no matter how much we try to convince ourselves otherwise. 
Sebastian points a thin finger at the clustered lightning. I personally believe that the anomalies are the dome's security mechanism. The ones you saw are relatively harmless, but there are different anomalies in the desert, phenomena that toy with the human mind. Van Olden clasps his hands behind his back. I know you don't care, but I'll say it anyway. Scientists today are required to be wonder workers who can heal cancer with a wave of their hand and solve the secrets of the universe during their coffee break. For some reason, no one wants to understand that fundamental science is always an investment in the future. It produces no answers here and now. The White's gaze strays back to his clipboard. If something terrible happens under the dome one day, and I'm sure it will, science will protect no one. That is all. Off you go. I hope to see you again soon. Welcome under the dome, an amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization. Listen to this information. And receive a colorful leaflet. Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit.
remember, our honest work will make the world a better place. World, a better place. useful for all wings and receive a colorful leaflet. Please stand by for decontamination to end. An amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization. Listen to this information, useful for all wings, and receive a colorful leaflet. Welcome under the dome, an amazing excursion to a world of new technology and the riddles of an ancient civilization. Listen to this information, useful for all Remember, wings, and receive our a colorful work will make the world a better place. World, a better place. Ed, spit it out. I can see that something's bothering you. Well, um, it's God, come on already. We can't just hand Miss Norway over to the Silver, see? She's, she's unique among relics. Ed, we already discussed this. The relics effect is well known. It's nothing but semantic imitation. I wrote you about it, remember? I know. Well, it's, there's something else. She's rational. No, really. But for hours, she... Damn it, Ed. The relic doesn't speak. It's some kind of subliminal wave field messing with your head. It's you having both sides of the conversation with Norway. It's all inside your head. You're imagining that it's rational. That's it. We've gone through all that. Uh, Doctor, what if it's the other way around? What if she made you believe she's not rational? Eddie! But you can't exclude the possibility, can you? By now, the clock provided me attention, two attention. stuff from Please handle film. relics carefully. In case of damage, your life will be forfeit. Employee, please come here. There's an earth. Well, hello there. Have a good one.
How can I help? Attention, attention. Please handle relics carefully. In case of damage, your life is important. Our honest work will make the world a better place. World, a better place. work will make the world a better place. World, a better place. Have a good one. Good day to you. Oh, you again. The giant display glows welcomingly when you approach. A red light comes on Attention. under the screen's Attention. steel hood. The camera is switched on. In case of damage, A gray old man with high cheekbones appears and squints out at you from the screen. Do you copy? He leans close to the camera, his glasses glittering. My name is Martin Kingsley. I'm chief officer of Magellan Base. We were supposed to meet in person. But unforeseen circumstances prevented that. One moment. I'll grab your file. He reaches for something out of view and produces a thin folder with your name on the cover. Apparently, your file. Kingsley opens the folder to thumb through the pages. He marks one of the pages with a pencil. White Wing. You know, I have a great deal of respect for our science division. And I find the people intriguing as well. I shouldn't ask, but how did you come to choose this profession?
Martin taps his pencil on the desk, considering what to write. I'd like to believe that your understanding of your mission includes more mundane, down-to-earth tasks as well. Kingsley closes the file and folds his hands in front of him. Thank you for your reply. I learned a little more about you. Now I want you to learn a little bit more about us. Keep in mind, this is not a rehearsed speech. He assumes a serious expression. When the Dome was discovered in 1971, it became a scientific and media sensation, a worldwide phenomenon, and likely the most significant discovery in the history of mankind. Kingsley drums his fingers on the unseen desk, his gaze focused somewhere beyond. I see. You were enticed here by radio advertising, telefilms, and all those interviews, billboards at every turn. Crotus wants the world to see the Dome as a stage where something merry and fascinating is going on. But now that you're actually here, I want you to see the real picture. You can't make out his eyes behind the glare on his spectacles, but he seems to be staring directly at you. Here's the truth. Nobody was waiting for us inside the Dome. It's neither a treasury of technologies nor a cemetery of the ancients. Perhaps what we're doing now is diffusing the world's most complicated bomb. Will our mission thrive? I believe so. If we work together and everybody does their part. He looks back at your file. I say, do what must be done. Because that's what the concept of the Five Wings is all about. Kingsley points at the camera. You're from White Wing, and everybody else, even I myself, is working to allow you to do your part. But the inverse is also true. People are eagerly waiting for your results, discoveries, brilliant solutions to intractable problems, some progress to justify all the catastrophes and tragedies that happen here under the dome. Putting the folder aside, he sits back and stares at you in silence. It gets so quiet that the ticking of a clock can be heard through the speakers. Kingsley sighs quietly. You were probably waiting for some boilerplate welcome speech. But I prefer to talk about real-world problems. Glad to meet you. Martin nods slowly. I apologize once again for this long-distance meeting. Now, as we don't have much time, I'd like to get to the point. I'm sure you're curious why you were taking off the bus to Magellan and brought here instead. He moves closer to the camera. I'm going to show you a short video. Please pay attention. Kingsley's face freezes on screen. I have an urgent mission for an employee of your background and qualifications. I'd have assigned someone from Magellan but I'm short on personnel. That's why it has to be a newcomer. I apologize again for the rush, but it seems I have no choice. Martin noisily clears his throat. <clears throat> Maybe you've heard about Nashville Base. While preparing the materials for this mission, I came across a short documentary film about the complex. I think you should watch it. The speakers produce a hollow click. Purple, gray, and black spots flicker on the screen. A blurred title, the Cronus Archive 1971 to 1974, was used in the production of this recording, appears at the bottom. The shadow of an airplane flies across a faded yellow desert. A cheery voice fills the room. Every day, our researchers uncover more and more of the dome's secrets. There is no doubt the underground structures, so-called objects, are organized according to some pattern. Though early on, the importance of the relics to scientific research was considered insignificant. The desert dims into the black of a chalkboard. White lines drawn by an invisible hand begin to sketch a schematic of the dome. The narrator continues. By 1972, however, Many important discoveries had come to light in a period of only a few months, and the construction of stationary research bases adjacent to the more promising objects began. Personnel moved into Ankara in May of 1972, and within half a year, Boston and Dessau were also brought into service. 
though the biggest discovery was yet to come. The picture changes to a chasm suffused with electric light. People bustling about everywhere. The speaker's voice seems to come from a distance. In November of 1973, a massive network of underground caves and a structure of hitherto unseen complexity was discovered in Sector C-12. Soon afterwards, the construction of C-12 Nashville began. The camera glides through dim caverns as the silhouettes of bizarre mechanisms emerge. Metal structures loom up from the dark, surrounded by earth-moving machines and exhausted miners wearing orange jumpsuits. The speaker continues. C-12 Nashville is an innovative research complex located atop the primary relic mining location. The complexity of this object is unique. Communications. The film abruptly cuts out and Kingsley's face reappears. The rest of this information is classified. Hopefully you get the main idea. Nashville is a very special place, requiring people with both special qualifications and special clearance level, though yours will do for your task. The chief officer bends threateningly close to the camera. I thought I made myself clear. That information is classified. Kingsley lowers his eyes and flips through some documents. Only the driver. The rest of the group has already departed. I'll tell you everything you need to know, don't worry. Martin adjusts his glasses. So, the task. Nashville Base stopped transmitting and receiving signals yesterday evening. A reconnaissance group was sent out earlier today, but we haven't heard anything from them yet either. The chief officer rubs his forehead. Normally, I would never give this task to a newcomer like yourself, but I just don't have enough people. He looks down at the documents again. Furthermore, the group was lacking someone with your specialization. It has been reported that nearby anomalous zones are unusually active. I suspect a scientific approach will be needed to resolve their communication problems. Kingsley is looking into the camera once more. Your task is to get to Nashville, figure out whatever's behind the communication problem, get in touch with the group, and work with them to solve the problem. The chief officer carefully returns the documents to the folder. You notice his hands tremble slightly. Go downstairs. The truck must be waiting for you in storage. This task is urgent, but a small delay is acceptable if there's anything you need to settle here first. That is all. Any questions? Kingsley's hand reaches toward the camera. Great to hear. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>